ジョイトズパッドキャスト変革への道こんにちは伊藤ジョイスです今日のゲストはロレンス・レシックです彼はハーバード法学部の教授でクリエイティブ・コモンズの創業者で僕も本当に昔からあのずっと仲良くしていろんなプロジェクトを一緒にやってきた人なんですけども彼はいろんな組織を作ってまあ、アメリカを中心なんですけども世界をどんどん良くしようとしていてかなり長いジャーニーを僕も一緒についてきたんですけども、まあ、今日彼の話を聞くのとても楽しみです。Hi Larry, thank you for coming to Tokyo for the conference and for being on this podcast.Every time you ask me, Joey, I come.Thank <laughs> you for that too.、Um, but every time you ask me to do something, I try to come.But <laughs> but, and I think the first thing you asked me to do was Join you in Creative Commons. And I'm trying to remember back、um, how we met, but you were, I think you were in Japan already, right? Was that, or you were here for the book for Code, and it was a Asahi Shimbun panel discussion or something. And I think I was on the panel with you. Is that, I think that's how we met. No, actually, we met. I was giving a speech. You walked in with a kind of gang of others, you were all wearing solid black. You like came to the front and you sat <laughs> and you stared ferociously at me as I spoke and you asked some pretty brilliant questions. And then you took me to dinner a couple nights after that. Really? Yeah. Okay. No, no, I, it would have been the beginning of 2001. And then、um, I came back in 2002, and that's when we, that's when we did the panel.、Yeah. And when was Creative Commons? When did you guys start? So, Creative Commons.、Uh, Had its launch in December of 2002. Yeah, and Creative Commons, that was a really in- exciting time. And and because had you been fighting copyright stuff before Creative Commons? Because that was the thing that I remember at the beginning, because I had been trying to understand copyright and open source, and it was a really important period for the internet. And, and I obviously knew about you. but Creative Commons was a deal that I made with my client, whose case I took to the Supreme Court. To try to strike、yeah. down the Copyright Term Extension Act.、Yeah. And Eric Eldred、um, you know, said he was very grateful for the work we were doing, but he didn't think we would possibly win in the Supreme Court.、Mm-hmm. He had no faith in the system. I was much more naive. I had faith.、Um, but he said, I don't want this just to end with a case. I want you to have to, pro- you have to promise me that we'll build something like a foundation、mm-hmm. or something. And I said, sure.、Um, mm-hmm. And、um, Um, I argued the case、um, in October 2002, and we launched Creative Commons in December 2002, and we lost the case in January 2003. I remember Eric,、um, he was on the board in、yeah. the early days. I have a picture here that we can post.、Um, actually, that, that board meeting set.、Um, That I, I, I took photos They're of. They're beautiful. That, that was one of my best sets. And what was interesting was it was a, it was a very tense board meeting, but I decided I was just going to take pictures. And, and some of the best pictures of those people are from that board meeting because it turns out that when you're kind of intensely thinking, that you actually, especially if you're a law professor, you look your best. <laughs> <laughs> you're not saying much, but yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> but no, that was, that, that was a good set. But people were pretty annoyed when I was taking the photos, I remember. Yeah, but I think it was a, a kind of productive distraction because it kind of brought people back down to earth. Like yeah, it was a、yeah. discharge of static electricity. I think the Creative Commons board meetings were some of the most intense board meetings.、Um, and that, that was a really difficult organization.、Um, I mean, it's still difficult, but I think when we were there, I mean, I think of all of the different things that I've had to think about and wrangle. It was very complicated. It was hard to raise money for. It still is hard to raise money for. It's a, and it's very Lessigian in that it's like almost too clever by half. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's very nuanced. And so you get attacked from both sides. And your followers are these kind of, and you, I think this is your traditional follower, but it's kind of the fanatical nerd, do gooder, somewhat technical, somewhat legal. And it turns out there's a lot of them, which is pretty amazing. But,、um, But it's, a, it's, it's an amazing community, and I think it was very rewarding.、Um, I was looking back in my blog, and 2004、yeah. was when it was a Business 2.0 did the article called The Sharing Economy. And I think you and I both sort of were waving this around, saying, see, even a business magazine is saying sharing economy is business. And back then, though, when we said sharing economy, we meant Creative Commons. And then it became the word that we used to describe Uber and Airbnb. 
And I felt like the word was usurped from us. Yes. But now with Web3, it's really interesting how potentially um, the sharing economy could flip into a DAO and become this hybrid of commercial and non-commercial. And, and you mentioned it a little bit in your talk, but I wonder if you sort of merge the streams of Creative Commons, Web3, and this idea of sharing economy. Do you, do you, are you, you know, excited about it? And where do you see it going? Yeah, I mean, the one thing that we couldn't do when we were thinking about the sharing economy circa 2004 is provide creators with some commercial outlet for their work. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were trying to convince them to license their work under a CC license, which meant it could be spread everywhere. And they rightly said, well, then what's the potential revenue that I could be getting from this? And we created, remember CC Plus, we had a, mm -hmm. we had a system where you could like, for example, license it under a CC non-commercial license, but you could click through and you could license a commercial part of it. But it was cumbersome. The technology in that early stage of the web was very hard and, and there was no reliability to it. Mm -hmm. um, but what's happened now with NFTs is that um, we're, at a, we're in a place where you could have an NFT with, I'm not gonna call it a smart contract. It's, it's such a <laughs> stupid word. If, you know, you go into a house and it's got smart appliances and they're supposed to connect to your Bluetooth, but they never connect. They never work. Smart appliances are always dumb. So I don't know why we call them smart contracts. They're not smart contracts. It's a code or a codified contract. It's a contract in the technology. So I'm going to call it a code contract. So, so now with NFTs, you could have a code contract that allows the author or the creator to earn a perpetual revenue stream every time the NFT is sold um, so that they could sell the NFT and then spread the image broadly. So people are like, that's really cool. And as a lot of people think the image is really cool, that increases the demand for the NFT and um, they can win and the, the, the world can have free content that they can take and they can mm -hmm. build upon. That is a much better technical implementation of the sharing economy mm -hmm. than we could build or talk about 20 years ago. So it does excite me. Now, you know, we can't predict whether it will work in mm -hmm. the sense that a lot of digital artists will be able to make money in this way. You know, I think that's ultimately the test of any system. Can it support the artists? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I certainly think we should try it and we should get beyond the kind of, I think, stupid cynicism or skepticism that, um, you know, I, I understand why it was triggered by the kind of copyright bro, I mean, the crypto bro um, mania. But I think mm -hmm. if you look deeper, there's there's a there there. Mm -hmm. And we should try to make it into the thing that we mm -hmm. have been trying to build for 20 years. I mean, it is a programming language for contracts. And you can create contracts that create schemes that, you know, steal people's money, but you can write contracts to do anything you want. And I think that's the missing idea. And I think the problem is the people who can imagine what sorts of things to build that we would want just aren't learning the programming language because yes. it's associated with these other structures that they think are antisocial. Yeah. Can, can I just go back? It was a really great, really smart way you put that. And I want to just emphasize a point about it. So you said you can write contracts to steal things, but you can write contracts to do great things. And that's the really interesting thing about code contracts. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can write them to do either thing. Legal contracts or contracts in the real world, you can't, right? I can't write a contract where I, I contract with you to kill somebody. That's just not a contract. It's mm -hmm. not an enforceable agreement. Mm -hmm. But in the code world, it could be an enforceable agreement. I mean, not killing, but you know, the mm -hmm. equivalent, stealing a bunch of money. And so this is like one important difference with code contracts and real contracts is that mm -hmm. the law more um, aggressively polices the real contracts versus the code contracts. Mm -hmm. But still, the code contracts have an enormous potential mm -hmm. to lower the cost of reliable reliability mm -hmm. in the context of agreements. Mm -hmm. I mean, the problem with a real contract in the real space is I can say, yeah, I'm going to sue you. But we know that the cost of suing you is just too great. Right. It would ne you would never enforce it. It's just a waste of waste of your breath. But in the code space, mm -hmm. it's just a machine. It will, it will enforce it because the machine has the infrastructure to enforce it. And it really can uh, radically increase the reliability of agreements. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. we ought to celebrate that. And we ought to be trying to build it out as broadly as we can. Yep, I think that's exactly right. And it's, it's um, yeah, I mean, to say what you said in, in, in a slightly different way, but is that in the real world, you have to have humans enforce the contracts. But with code contracts, 
Uh, Yay. <laughs> you, you have the contract built into the thing, whether it's putting money into the contract or the contract into a machine. And I think that's, it's, it's, it's so significant. And so, so how do we, I guess that's the, the thing that I'm hoping we can do in Japan, which is because it doesn't have as much stigma, maybe we can have people who want to write wonderful things um, being imaginative. Because, because I think that's the other thing is any new medium of expression starts out sort of mimicking some other thing and it tends to evolve. And sometimes you get big leaps of creativity, but that it's, I think it's difficult to get people to be creative in a completely new medium. And often I think it comes from like the th interesting things, video games already have had some version of code contracts because like you can encode in mm -hmm. a video game, lots of things. And so I think that's why a lot of web three is a metaphor of what happened in video games. And it appeals to the same sorts of people who played video games. And I think the difficulty is that um, we haven't even had the idea of code contracts anywhere else. Um, and I'm not, I mean, and, and I think, but I get, the good thing, I guess, is that more people who play video games are in other fields now, but. Um, They're kind of growing, growing up. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I've been advising uh, Clang, um, mm -hmm. which is developing the game Seed, and they're trying to build governance inside of the game. And, it, and that's exactly this that we're building. Like we're imagining how do you build DAOs inside of the game? How do you build a contracting language inside of the game? How do you make it so people can create, you know, groups that want to act together? Mm -hmm. um, so that you know, you, in the world of Warcraft, you might have a guild of like twenty people, but it's hard to have a guild of two hundred people mm -hmm. um, because you can't coordinate that much. But mm -hmm. you could if mm -hmm. you could have code-based agreements that enforce or carry uh, agreements into effect. Um, so I think that one reason that game will be exciting is that it's kind of aiming for a. A, a, a demographic of people who spend a lot of time when they were teens and early 20s playing games, but mm -hmm. then they go off and become adults and they can't spend 12 hours a day mm -hmm. playing games, mm -hmm. but they want to do something. And like, I think that that generation um, will have a more um, developed intuition mm -hmm. about these ideas than obviously we boomers were. Because I remember when I was teaching that course on AI and ethics, it was like Harvard law school students and MIT engineers, roughly. And we had MIT engineer, well, at least one MIT student became, joined the Harvard JD program, but not the other way around. And I'm curious whether you see law school as, like, where do you see law schools going? I mean, you talked about this a little bit in, 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 on, on stage, but um, is there a way to get lawyers more involved in the creativity or do you think it's, because law is hard, right? It's not, and I think that a lot of the failure of Web3 are kids underestimating um, law and what law is and not understanding it and other people not understanding sort of macroeconomics and things like that and they're figuring it out but sort of through trial and error. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a great conversation to facilitate. Hal Abelson, who was one of the co-founders of mm -hmm. CC with us, um, and I in 1998 taught a class where half the students were MIT students and half were law students. And they had to be in groups, and half the group had to be MIT, and half had to be law students. And the whole exercise was just getting them to realize how serious and um, difficult the other side was. Um, and I think technologists in particular don't um, have much reason to understand um, the complexity in law. Uh, I mean, they think the complexity is just a bug. Um, I mean, I remember I, 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 once, I once had you know, er early in like 1995 or so, I had um, lunch with a guy who's gone on to start one of the most interesting blockchain companies. Um, and he was talking about trying to make contracts that would be um, perfectly reliable in the sense that every single detail would be fully specified. And he said, the real problem with contracts in the real world is there's all these holes that are not fully specified. If we could just eliminate all that, then um, we could make really efficient contracts. And I said to him, you know, that's not a bug, that's a feature. Because mm -hmm. you're sitting down, you're negotiating a contract and you think of one possibility that you know you're never gonna get an agreement on. So rather than trying to hammer out an agreement on that term that you know you'll never get an agreement on, you punt, you make a little vague reference mm -hmm. that both sides can read the way they wanna read. And you say to yourself, well, there's a one in a thousand chance that's gonna happen. So, you know, probably won't happen. But if it does happen, then we'll go to a judge and we'll plead our case to the judge and we'll get the judge to fill it out. And if you force them 
to specify that, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have had a contract, mm -hmm. right? So like it was, and it was kind of interesting. It was the first time he kind of thought, wow, <laughs> there might actually be sense to this. And mm -hmm. the other part that he, I didn't think he really even had thought about at that point is, you know, I said, look, the contract is gonna increase the reliability of your transaction by some ar arbitrary amount. Let's say rather than being, um, you know, without a contract, you've got a 50% chance the other guy would renege. With the contract, you've got a 20% chance the other guy would renege. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and he would say something like, yeah, I want to get to a 0% chance. And I would be like, well, you know, maybe 20% is not bad. Maybe it's cheaper just to get insurance for the 20%. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then you've got the insurance plus the contract, and you're in perfectly good shape. And it might be that the insurance cost mm -hmm. is less than the negotiating cost, or mm -hmm. less than the cost of getting to a final agreement. And so it's like recognizing contract is within a system of economics and norms mm -hmm. and uh, legal enforcement. Yep. Um, and you've always got to think about all of them together. Mm -hmm. And when we imagine code contracts, there'll be a similar kind of trade-off. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be 100% certainty for 99.999% of the contracts. Mm -hmm. And if it's not 100% certain, there's always markets of insurance to cover the, the, mm -hmm. the gap between certain and where the contract is. I remember, I think you were the one that, this is sort of going back to the Lissigian quadrants, but if you want to get people to slow down, um, they're speeding, you can build a speed bump, which is sort of a technical solution. You could levy a fine, which um, the police can um, catch you for, which would be, I guess, a, 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 I guess it's legal and market. market. Yeah. And that there are just tools, but people will still speed. And, um, and, and, and I think that that's a general problem that I think people have is they think of the law as kind of like geometry, where you can like solve, you know? Mm. And, 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 and I think in general, um, even the AI people I find um, think that like it's a utility function, like life is a game and you could win the game. And if you can win the game, I can teach a machine to win the game too. And that we just optimize, you know, and that it, the fact that you, you, I think, you know, ethics is about not being able to optimize for anything because every day it's a little bit different. What is more important to us as people. And I think that's the other thing that you know, on AI, which is, you know, I think what you want is an AI that's constantly updating its model of society by trying to infer what we want rather than us having to tell them what to optimize for and then mm -hmm. having them execute it, which is kind of the kind of AI that w we have today. Um, yeah, and, but the anxiety here is with AI, at what point do they decide that they actually know better? Well, how to give us what we want than we think we know. Yeah, well, so I think the way that, you know, I think at MIT, you know, Rebecca Sachs, who does theory of mind, the way they think about their style of AI is that an AI is constantly looking at you and has a model of what you or all of humanity wants. And it's trying to watch what you're doing to infer what you're trying to do and what you know. And it will constantly be trying to assist you in helping you do what you want. But it's never trying to in, like, guess what you might want if you were smarter, right? It will say, hey, it looks like you're w wanting to be healthy. Here are some other things you might do to be healthy. And then if you start veering in that direction, it, so there may be a, a sense that it, I could imagine it could try to influence you to be long-term, for yeah. example. But but that's yeah. but that's kind of assuming the AIs we got to worry about are the ones that work for us, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't be worrying about them as much. I would be worrying yeah. about the ones that work for other people. Right. right. So and, like, and so so it's still a people versus people thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It maybe. I mean, you know, if you, I, I like to think about like different kinds of instrumental rationality. Mm -hmm. So humans have an instrumental rationality. We're better than cattle mm -hmm. exercising our instrumental ra rationality. Um, uh, we can decide what we want to do and we aim for it and we get there. Corporations are better than humans mm -hmm. in instrumental rationality. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have, a, they have a metric and they have machines to calculate whether they're meeting their metric and, and they advance their instrumental rationality even if it conflicts with the humans, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they right. exercise control over the political process to yep. make it so that the humans think they're running their government, but in fact, they're not. It's the mm -hmm. corporations. Mm -hmm. I think AIs are another stage of yep. instrumental rationality, I, better than the corporations. Yeah, I, I would agree. And, and I, I think that corporations are actually, in fact, 
proto AIs, right? And, Imperfect and I, AIs. Yeah, yeah, and I think that you know Norbert Wiener would call them you know machines of flesh and blood. Yeah. So they're made yeah. of humans, but yeah. they're in fact um, autonomous. Right. 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 Yeah. And and but but I think the corporations kind of believe that they control their AIs, just like we believe we control our I corporations, see, see. Right. and they don't. I mean, you remember that incredible story in 2017. Where Facebook, you know, had an AI trying to figure out which advertising categories it would offer its customers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden started offering the advertising category Jew haters, mm -hmm. and uh, because it's AI discovered there's a category of people called you know that we can describe as Jew haters, mm -hmm. and we can make a lot of money if we sell ads to Jew haters, mm -hmm. um, and of course then Facebook discovered this when ProPublica wrote an article about it, mm -hmm. and they were mm -hmm. shamefaced and embarrassed because of course there was no human. That created the category Jew haters. It was the machine, mm -hmm. but the machine was just doing its job, right? And mm -hmm. um, Facebook realized it just couldn't control its machine. Yeah. Well, I, I think that you know the for me the short term thing that I'm trying to get right is um, Web three because I think it's the code contract is the new form of expression that's going to be the you know one of the primary ways that we are going to coordinate human activity. But then you plop on top of that AI, and I think it's going to be very different. And the way I imagine it is that it's like we're putting, we're about to put jetpacks on humanity. Mm -hmm. And if we're not pointed in the right direction, we're going to go careening off in whatever terrible direction we're headed. And I feel like the combination of using Web3 tools to better, I guess it gets back to sort of your work on democracy. It's, it's, I think we need to get humanity pointed in the right direction with the right values before we put the jetpacks on. And I'm hoping that Web3 can help with that, but it's definitely not a given. Yeah, especially because, I mean, I think the problem in democracy is that the AIs that are already in our life mm -hmm. are so poisoning us mm -hmm. that we can't address issues in a sensible way. You know, we're just driven into these polarized corners and we don't even have a common set of facts that we understand the world to be. You know, in the United States right now, the, the same number of people today believe the election was stolen in 2020 as believed it on January 6th. And that is astonishing mm -hmm. because we've had, you know, two years of real data about whether mm -hmm. that hypothesis was true or not. Um, mm -hmm. And yet the group that thinks that it's true has been impervious to that data um, mm -hmm. because they live in a media bubble that feeds them all the information they want. It's just a hoax. It's like all made up. Um, the, facts that this was a fair election. That's just the deep state trying to build in support for its corrupt, you know. And, and you're like, well, how do you run a democracy mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. we can't even agree on the most fundamental facts? And you know, the election is one thing. Think about, we lost a million people in America to COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and part of the reason we lost so many is because partisan attitudes around COVID. Now, mm -hmm. yeah, I think this is a disease. Like, how can there be partisan attitudes? But there's actual data that now shows that Republican regions had a much higher death rate, much higher exposure, and much higher um, uh, infection rates than Democratic mm -hmm. areas because they live in a bubble of like, it's fake, it's all made up. It's all, you know, this is oppression to have to wear a mask. Um, and, you know, and it's like, if we can't even agree on a global pandemic, I don't know what the hell we can do. So what's what's your theory of how we make it better? You know, you can't take on the institutions and change them. Mm -hmm. I think you got to build something new mm -hmm. that people migrate to. You know, when you think about technology, that's always been the case. Like it's, you know, it's like people wanted to see things different. You could have imagined them taking on, you know, IBM. Mm -hmm. Now we're just going to build something new. and. Mm -hmm. um, people will migrate to it. So I think we gotta figure out how we build something where people can be engaging on ideas or political stuff in a context that brings out the best of humanity. You know, there's mm -hmm. the, you know, the slow food movement, mm -hmm. which is, you know, says, we know about human bodies. And we know that if you cook your own food and you eat it with friends slowly over, you know, a long dinner, you will be fine that your body can process that food well. It's mm -hmm. when you eat this processed food that has been made by a chemical factory, mm -hmm. and then you eat it quickly, um, that your body can't handle it. So just fit the food to your body. I think we ought to recognize there's a slow democracy movement that mm -hmm. sort of says, okay, we know how the human mind works. 
being you know hit with Instagram or tweets driving you in one way or the other that's not good you can't mm -hmm. we can't process that stuff well uh, but we can like sitting in a group small group fed information having a chance to reflect and talk about what we're talking about we can deal with that mm -hmm. we can do that well so we have to find a way to channel politics mm -hmm. into places where humans can can digest it mm -hmm. in an effective way mm -hmm. and they can finish the process and walk away and think okay here's what i now think um and that won't mean like shutting down facebook or twitter although mark zuckerberg is doing a pretty good job in shutting down facebook and um uh you know elon musk is losing all of his advertisers so maybe there will be no twitter but you know it doesn't mean necessarily destroying these mm -hmm. but it does mean like finding a way to build something different that can be more healthy than they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I do worry about the slow democracy branding. I remember when I first heard about slow food, I thought it was just like bad service, you know? <laughs> but, but, um, well, you see, with food, there is good service, but with democracy, there's no good democracy. So yeah, yeah. it's not confusing. Well, I mean, as a former constitutional law professor, I guess you what still are a former. You're right. still. Um, <laughs> What, what is the most functional democracy that you think exists right now? You know, it, it's unfair because these are countries which don't need to deal with the most difficult right. issue of democracy, which is diversity. Mm -hmm. You know, so you think the Scandinavian countries or Iceland, these are really effective democracies. They have high turnout. They produce governments that can actually do stuff. Mm -hmm. You're like, that's, that's what it should be like. But, you know, they're also one... Uh, culture. They're monocultures. Yeah. I mean, um, Japan's almost monoculture, but yeah. we're not very good at democracy. <laughs> well, you, yeah, you're not great because I, we could talk about the reasons for that, but it's, but it's not. Yeah. So, I mean, there's complicated reasons for that. Part of that's the United States, which mm -hmm. subsidized a party here. So it would be a dominant party against, you know, the Soviet mm -hmm. threat. But, you know, bracketing that, I think that, you know, the real, th the real tr truth is that we, we've never really had a large-scale, multi-culture democracy mm -hmm. that has worked over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And even in America, like we've had many cultures, but we've never integrated or never empowered them until relatively recently. Mm -hmm. And for the Japanese, what, I mean, you know, we, we're in this relationship with America, with the US, what's dad gonna turn into? Well, with respect to Japan, you're not going to see much until 2025 when right. the next president comes into office. I mean, you have a you have a very competent ambassador, a serious ambassador, unlike the ambassador under Trump. Mm -hmm. um, this is a really serious player. That means take Japan very seriously, as they should. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the Republican Party under um, President Trump is going to sell out to the Russians, no doubt. Mm -hmm. um, so the Ukraine. It's going to spin in the other way, and the battle with China is going to be quite aggressive. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of people in the American military who are like, "When are we going to get to use these guns? Mm -hmm. Like, when? What are these missiles for? Mm -hmm. Why do we have these battleships if we're not going to be deploying them someplace? And the nicest place to deploy them, in their mind, is the South China Sea, mm -hmm. where we can defend freedom and." Uh, and start World War III. Um, so, I, I mean, it's hard to be, it's hard to think that you're exaggerating just how bad things can be. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite signs is, um, tomorrow will be worse. It's on Puck. Um, and there's a kind of <laughs> sense of this, tomorrow is just gonna be worse. <laughs> Yeah, that's unfortunately kind of on brand for you. Right Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how? But in t where where is your, your work right now? I mean, I think a lot of Japanese probably the last time they heard from you, we were running for president. And and what what what's what have you done since then? And where are you headed? Well, I'm trying to build the slow democracy movement. Mm -hmm. That's nothing that's going to be or appear significant for ten years but that's where a lot of my energy is. And I'm also trying to build a strategy to kind of get the political system out of its, its stalemate. Um, mm -hmm. So um, that's you know, writing something and trying to pull together uh, a, a weird mix of political forces that kind of open up the opportunity um, 
between you know two parties that seem both terrible to most Americans. Um, so that you know, it's a lot of slow work um, because it turns out the problem is much harder than mm -hmm. I think anybody really imagined it would be. It's interesting. I I I do think that in Japan there are systems in politics and government that are much worse than they are in the U.S., but there isn't the outrage here um, that we have in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, look, the bureaucracy in Japan is obviously a source of enormous inefficiency in Japan. But you were blessed by the constitutional provision that forbid you from building a defense because you have enormous wealth that has gone into the project of building a society that's good for everybody you know, the middle mm -hmm. class in particular. So the infrastructure projects, which I know we've talked about, mm -hmm. you, you know, I think rightly have pointed out, maybe they've been too extreme, like too much has been spent on that stuff. But you've been able to afford turning a modern country into a country that helps everybody. In the United States, our bridges are falling down. Mm -hmm. You know, our highways mm -hmm. don't work. We don't have trains. You know, mm -hmm. China since 2000 has built something like 18,000 miles of high speed, ra speed railroad. The United States since 2000 has built zero miles of high-speed railroad. Mm -hmm. We can't even think about how we do projects like that. Mm -hmm. um, and you think, why? Because you don't have any money? No, because we spend all of our money on building bombs and aircraft carriers and nuclear weapons and, and, and a military that's in every port around the world, including uncomfortably in ports in this country. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, and this is the hardest problem to get over in the United States. You can't talk about this in the United States mm -hmm, mm -hmm. without people thinking you're a Russian spy. Um, mm. And and yet, I think this is the the biggest thing. The United States has got to stop being an imperial power. I mean, you remember we, we were once at dinner with um, George Lucas, and mm -hmm. uh, I said to George Lucas, "So, is the Death Star the United States?" And he said, of course, it's the United States. Oh, funny. <laughs> I said, you know, nobody in the United States thinks it's the United States. We all think, you know, we are the rebel forces. But you can see that's exactly who we are. We are the Death Star. We roll our Death Star up to, you know, in the Persian Gulf. And we say, if you don't obey, uh -huh. it's the end. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, well, I, you know, I, I, we, we're always trying to figure out ways to get you more involved in Japan. I think that you know, with Web3, with the local governments, and with, even though it's, you know, a lot of the old structures aren't gonna change that easily, we're trying to do experiments. And it'd be interesting, you know, we're, you're working with Kim on CrowdSmart. I think there are some interesting governance things. I mean, she's working, I guess, in, in Cincinnati, but I think the cities thing yeah. and, um, and using code contracts and, um, you know, civic engagement with civil services. I think there's something there. And I think if that, if nothing else, if that can inspire people to take code contracts seriously as a programming language for governance, that might allow us to do something. Yeah, if we can make it visible and, mm -hmm. and to bring a whole bunch of people into the building of it, yeah, that yeah. might do something. So um, let's, let's work on that together. Okay. Okay, thanks, Larry. Thanks, Joey.